Trayano was heralded as one of the godfathers of Pokemon ROM hacking, with his work spanning back over 15 years. As a sort of personal challenge, I decided that I was going to beat every single one of his games as a deathless hardcore Nuzlocke. Today, we'll be starting with his first project, Fire Red Omega, a fairly bare-bones enhancement hack of the classic Pokemon Fire Red. For this run, I'll be playing with a specific set of rules designed to make this game as difficult as possible. As you all know, I play with a hardcore Nuzlocke rule set, but we'll also be adding on several restrictions. EVs or effort values have been removed from the game to stop my Pokemon from getting stronger than the enemies. In addition to that, I've implemented extra level caps for non-gym leader boss fights to tighten up EXP and remove the level advantage the player normally has for those battles. I've also banned all stat boosting moves like Dragon Dance and Swords Dance, as well as weather setting abilities and moves like Drizzle or Rain Dance. But the last and most important rule is that if a single Pokemon faints, my run is over. If you enjoy this type of content and want to see more, feel free to like, subscribe, and follow me on Twitch where I stream from time to time. If you're on the hunt for documentation, feel free to join my Discord as I post resources there that you won't find anywhere else. Without further ado, let's get into the run. Fire Red Omega replaces the standard Kanto starters with a trio of Magby, Elekid, and Smoochum. All three starters have had each of their base stats increased by 10, and there's advantages and disadvantages to every pick. For example, my choice of Elekid gives me an easier Misty, an electric immunity with Volt Absorb, and a ton of firepower into the Elite Four. It also gives my rival an absolutely demonic Smoochum and Jinx later on, which are very difficult to counter. I decide to reset for a good nature and IV Flashfire Houndour in Viridian City, arguably the best encounter in the game, and a good check to the scary Smoochum. I decide to take whatever I get on Route 1, so Nidoran Male is on the team for Attempt 1. On Route 22, we get a Guts Rotata, although this guy lacks all the moves and stat buffs that make it good in a lot of other hacks. Unfortunately, it's pretty underwhelming here, although it does serve as a very valuable dupe. Shortly after catching Rotata, we have our first rival fight. This team is very tame, as Elekid beats the Zubat, and Houndour and Elekid can double team the Smoochum. On Route 2, we can pick up a Gift Trico. Sceptile can be an Elite 4 candidate if it hits high enough IVs, and while mine is good, it misses the mark. Viridian Forest gives us a Pidgey, which is not buffed and is not remarkable in any way, shape, or form. Once I get to Pewter City, I can grab a Gift Mudkip, which is another high quality and fairly important encounter. This brings us to the first gym leader, Brock who uses his signature rock types and a lower accurate Vulpix. Rock leads with Geodude who gets one shot by an Absorb from Trico. This baits in Rhydon who knows Flamethrower and I switch in Mudkip as the AI prioritizes speed control and clicks Rock to. It then clicks Horn Attack as Mudkip takes the KO. A held Orenberry lets us get some health back as Kabuto comes in. I can switch back to Trico on a soft Absorb and kill it with an Absorb of my own. Vulpix comes in and my plan is to 1v1 this with Flashfire Houndour. However, this thing is an absolute hacks machine, and after a little bit of back and forth, I realized that this was not going to work. So, I did what any gamer would do and proceeded to PP stall the absolute shit out of it. I successfully managed to stall it out of everything but embers, so I can finally 1v1 it with Houndour using a 30 power, 70 accuracy smog to wither it down and eventually kill it. When the Onyx comes out, I go Nidoran into Trico and chunk it with Absorb. The Onyx takes speed control and then begins to spam its stat inducing moves like Swagger and Dragon Breath. This Onyx single-handedly inspired SHF to make the Kaizo games. I don't know if that's actually true, but I heard it from someone in a Discord call once. Anyways, I have to break through paralysis and confusion to beat this thing, and thankfully I do. Omanite comes in and Trico gets hacked even more before clutching up and hitting another round of absorbs to take it out, winning us badge 1 of Fire Red Omega. On Route 3, I catch a Vulpix and then take the guaranteed Magikarp at the Pokemon Center on Route 4. I pick up Aeron in Mount Moon, which is really good in spite of having a pretty much non-existent move pool in this game. I fish up a Horsey in Cerulean City and then head to a nasty Nugget Bridge rival fight. This rival fight has serious hands, and while with basic hardcore rules, you can delay this until after Misty, because of our hard level caps, we have to fight it now. This is the fight where the legend of the Demon Smoochum was born, and the lack of resources you have at this point makes this even more difficult. Elekid can 1v1 the illegal level 18 Golbat and take it out with two Thunder Punches. Abra comes in next, and this thing does nothing, so a couple of Leers into a physical smog from Houndour can easily take it out. Snubble comes in next, and I use Aeron to deal with it, which does so with ease. The Demon Smoochum hits the fuse,
field, and I'm prepared to throw the rest of my team at this thing. I pivot through Vulpix to get Hound Hour in for free, and I can get an Ember off for about half. I dodge a crit and get another one off, although it low rolls and Smoochum Citrus Berry procs. I try to work on it with Gyarados, but then get crit, meaning that I can only get one bite off. I then hard switch to Rat and take it out with a quick attack, winning us the dangerous Nugget Bridge rival fight. Before Misty, I pick up two more encounters in VA Chinchu and Curlia, which can be guaranteed with a Repel Minute. This Curlia is a little risky to catch due to it having teleport, but it's a lot better than everything else on the route, so it's well worth the risk in my opinion. Trace and Synchronize are both really good abilities to have in your box. Misty is considered by many to be one of the hardest fights in the game. Her team is pretty formidable considering what you'll have in your box at this point. There's some interesting interactions here because while you do have access to some items now via Thief, there's a lot of status on her team and you kind of have to pick your poison in terms of what you want to play around. This fight however is a big reason why I take Elekid as my starter. Elekid can chain 4 kills in a row, Okoing Staryu, Psyduck, and Seedra, while also being able to 1v1 the Love Disc. I bring in Chinchu on a Water Pulse from Starmie and try to paralyze it although I get hacked. I can bring in Grovile on a weak shockwave and absorb for a little bit of chip damage. And before you ask, yes, absorb is my best grass stab up to this point in the game. After another absorb, I can pivot back into Elekid for free and with a plus B nature, outrun the Stormy and finish it off. Then I can beat Togetic and dodge potential metronome fiction to win us our second batch. Following our gym fight with Misty, we can Repel Manip to guarantee Taylor. This is not as insane as it may seem, largely due to the fact that there's no facade access until the post game. In the underground path, we can pick up a Chikorita, which isn't great, but is a free encounter, so we'll take it. Route 6 Fishing gets me Carvana, which is one of the unsung heroes of this run, and a pretty underrated Pokemon in this game. Vermilion City Fishing gives me a Whelmer, and a trip to the SSN gets me Krabby, both of which are valuable fishing dupes. In the SSN, and we face off with our rival once again, although this fight isn't as crazy as the Nugget Bridge one. My newly evolved Electabuzz hits the entry frag on his lead Golbat, Nidoking beats the Grand Bull, and once again Kadabra does nothing to Hound him. I roar out the Jinx so that I can have an effectively free switch. I begin to wither the Jinx down as it puts me to sleep, but I sit on this thing so hard that I can stay in until I wake up, taking the KO. The Kadabra comes back in, and as I mentioned earlier, it can't hit Hound him, so it's free for the dog. There's an interesting interaction in Diglett's cave, where you have a good chance of getting a Diglett or Doug Trio, but there's a small chance at Dunsparce. You can Repel Manip to get Dunsparce out of the encounter pool, but then you have a higher chance at catching an overleveled Doug Trio. I decide not to Manip, and my gamble does not pay off as I hit the Dunsparce, which is a bit unfortunate for the upcoming fight with Lieutenant Surge. Surge is an interesting fight, especially without the widely available fast ground type that tears it open. Marsh Dump can 1v1 the lead Flaffy through some healing item spam from Surge. Next up is Chinchu, and this thing is a hacks machine. I switch between Bayleaf and Marsh to get Bayleaf in on something that's not Confuse Ray, but it's to no avail. I sit on it though, and I just stay in and get hacked and ball hard to hit some magical leaves to take this thing out. Manectric is out next, and a crit flamethrower means that I have to dodge a crit on Crunch, but after a mud shot, I can go back into Electabuzz and kill with two karate chops despite a static proc. Jolteon comes in, and I can use Nidoking for this guy, and I actually have a clean 1v1. Raichu should be free, but forgetting to pre-poison my lantern is about to cost me, and now I can get T-waved and can't just keep baiting focus punches to kill it. So, I devise an impromptu plan where I decide that critical hits do not exist and stack Intimidates on Raichu and bait electric moves back into lantern to heal it. Then, I can eventually get a T-wave off and go into Nidoking to kill with Dig and Chain Magneton after as well. This was such a nasty fight, and frankly harder than it needed to be. Yes, there's a lot of status in fiction, but not pre-poisoning Lantern was a blunder. I hadn't been taking the game very seriously up until this point, and I knew that I needed to lock in from here on out. I know it's attempt one, and it's not all going to be perfect right away, but I'm better than that. Shortly after Surge's gym, I can fish for a guaranteed Dratini on Route 11. I can then trade this for Larvitar, which ends up being a slight blunder, and I'll explain why. 
Tyranitar has the ability Sandstream, typically, which sets weather and is something that I'm not allowing for this run. Usually, you can just change the ability by using a save file editor like PKX. But in Gen 3, for whatever reason, the ability is unable to be changed, so in order to honor our weather ban, I decided to box it once it evolved into Tyranitar. I know the one person who plays Gen 3 Hackmons is going to give me a fucking earful in the comments section, but let's move on. On Route 9, I pick up a Gift Bulbasaur, grab Voltorb on Route 10, and Rapelmanip in Rock Tunnel to score a Beldum. Outside of Celadon on Route 7, I grab a Shroomish, which is quite good. In Celadon City, I'm gifted an Eevee, which I evolve into Espeon since I am in need of a fast Psychic type, having missed out on Alakazam and Starmie thus far. After a trek through the game corner, it's time for a common run killer. This fight won't wipe you in a regular run, but in a Nuzlocke like this, it's absolutely terrifying. Giovanni 1 doesn't seem too scary on paper, but this fight has random AI, introducing a ton of RNG into the mix. Giovanni leads with Rhyhorn, and I have an easy entry frag with Grovile. I can go to Gardevoir on Vibrava and Trace Levitate to become immune to its ground stab. We can take an easy kill with Ice Punch. This baits in the Kangaskhan, which effectively box checked me. I switch Breloom in on a nasty double edge, and a held Citrus Berry keeps me semi-healthy. It double edges again, and I dodge a second crit to take the KO. I can then beat the incoming Mightygino with Lairon, and take the Kingler with Grovile. I got a ball hard on this Persian though, and Nidoking dodges a crit to beat it, getting us out of the game corner alive. Erika is considered to be one of the harder fights in the game as well, although we have a good matchup into it. This is a Swellow fight, and it plays a very pivotal role here. With a combination of Guts, a Sharp Beak, and Badge Boost, we can chain two kills on the lead Victory Bell and incoming Ludicolo. This baits in Blissey, and I use Lantern to pivot into Breloom for an easy kill. This baits in Vileplume, and I pivot through a pre-burned Nidoking into Houndoom and take two kills on it and the Blossom. Lastly, the Bright Powder Jump Bluff comes in, and I use Guts Aerial Ace to never miss and secure an easy KO, winning us badge number four. After beating Erika, we head over to Lavender Town, where we have yet another face-off with our lovely rival. He leads with Golbat as I lead with Electabuzz for an easy entry frag. Swampert beats the incoming Flaffy and Houndoom as well as it just locks into a Solar Beam. This Jinx is a little more manageable and Matang can hold it down for us. The final Kadabra is food for Houndoom and that wins us the fight. Before anything else, I pick up a Ghastly and I play the newly acquired Pogi Flute to wake up the Static Snorlax on Route 12. After a few more predominantly useless encounters, we head over to Sylphco. The weird leveling and non-linearity in this split combined with our rule set makes the order we do things a little unorthodox. First, we need to get things rolling with the Sylphco rival. Agron 1v1s the lead Crobat, bringing in Houndu. Gyarados getting crit does not help our agenda, and we have to pivot around to take this thing out with Ravidash. Ampharos is up next, who is beaten by Swampert. The incoming Alakazam will try to trick a choice band onto you, so Houndu with no item will cause trick to fail and easily take this thing out. I did think about trying to steal this choice band, although I didn't have a great way to pull off the heist and still be able to 1v1 the Zam safely. Jinx is handled by Metagross and we win the first of four pivotal fights in this split. We then backtrack to Fuchsia City for another round of encounters and gym badge number five. The first addition to the team is a Gift Lapras, and I'm fortunate to grab a Trap Inch in the Safari Zone, which is really cool. There's a good chance you just end up with something that runs here, and Flygon is really good in this game, so I will happily take it. Hoga is the next challenge with a team of Poison Types and an Electrode for whatever reason. Espeon can take two kills on both Weezing and Venomoth to open things up. The Crobat comes in next and lets a Confuse Ray go into my Person Berry holding Metagross. This Crobat is another Hacks Machine, and while I do get a I kick off with Metagross, I have to go into Aggron to finish it off. This baits in Tentacruel, and I can switch into Flygon to kill it with an Earthquake. Electrode is out next, and I can use Pupitar to deal with it pretty easily. This is the unfortunate extent of the use this guy gets due to my little weather blunder, but this Electrode is a pain in the ass, so it's all good. I can switch back into Flygon while baiting either Spikes or Earthquake from Fortress, and it spikes up as I get Flygon in for free and kill it with a Flamethrower. It's time for more backtracking and a trip back to Sylphco to see Giovanni once again. 
This fight also has random AI, which is extra scary considering that there's a cloister that can go boom. Sharpedo is absolutely sick for this fight, and chains kills on Houndoom, Rhydon, and Nidoking, eliminating a lot of RNG on its own. Flygon comes out next, and Guard of War is good into this thing, being able to trace Levitate and make itself impervious to Flygon's powerful ground stab. Guard of War's great special bolt means that we can eat a fire blast and comfortably retaliate with an ice punch. Persian comes in next, and this thing is walled pretty hard by Aggron, who can 1v1 it and doesn't really care about the Starf Berry. Geo's last Pokemon is Cloyster, and this thing is a prayer session. Typically, with regular expert AI, the last Pokemon out cannot explode, but because of the random AI, this thing is totally unpredictable. So, I decide I'm going to throw Gengar at this and risk either the 1 in 16 Surfer Ice Beam crit instead of a potential 1 in 4 to boom on something else. Cloyster surfs, and Gengar holds to retaliate with a Thunderbolt, winning us the fight in a standoff with a potential run killer. We're flying through Kanto, and the gravy train doesn't stop here as we head right into Gym 6. Sabrina's psychic types are usually pretty exploitable, as her lead Mr. Mime is typically setup fodder for a lot of things. But because of our restrictions, we can't do that. I lead with Sharpedo, which can taunt it to shut it down, and then 1v1. This baits in Gardevoir, and I have a rough matchup into this thing, so I'm banking on Espeon being able to handle it. Espeon can come in on a weak Thunderbolt, and I can heal for free as Gardevoir sets up a wish. I then proceed to fraud pretty hard and 1v1 this thing, farming multiple bite flinches in the process. Sabrina's own Espeon then hits the field, and I use Mighty Yina to beat it with physical Shadow Balls. Sabrina's Gengar has a ton of status, so I decide to keep Mighty Yina in for a turn to get it put to sleep. I have a Chesto Berry on Houndoom, who is slower than the Gengar and needs to not come in on Hypnosis. I switch it on Ice Punch and get frozen. So now it's time to steer, and I switch Espeon in, and it gets frozen again. Gengar sets up a substitute, and luckily I can thaw and take the KO. That was pure luck. Doing it on wild Pokemon absolutely sucks, but this was a fight where I could have pre-slept some stuff to make my life a little easier, especially since there's no counterplay for multiple status conditions. Well, at least Metagross can beat the Jinx, and Snorlax can more than handle the incoming Alakazam, rounding out what was a pretty sketchy fight, despite not risking any crits. On the way over to Cinnabar Island, we pick up Quillfish, Wingull, and Articuno, who will never come out of the box. I thought I would catch the legendary bird for a change and see what it does, but unfortunately, it does pretty much nothing. Once we get to Cinnabar, we can pick up a few new encounters, the first of which is Ammonite, which does some really cool stuff with shell armor and moves like Tickle and Rest. At the Pokemon Mansion, I repelment it for a Camerupt, -up, which I can then trade for a guaranteed Naughty Nature 31 Attack IV Shogun, which of course evolves into the legendary Salamence. On Route 21, I can fish for Feebas, another excellent encounter with Elite Four potential. This brings us to Gym 7, which houses Blaine's fire types, although this gym is very easy, so I'll be brief. I lead with Kingdra on Blaine's Arcanine and take the kill with a Mystic Water Boosted Surf. Flygon can come in on a Hypnosis from Ninetales, wake up with a Chesto Berry, and then legitimately just clean out the rest of the fight with no problem. This thing is really the GOAT, and now we have 7 badges. The next split of the game is pretty interesting since you get sent to do the Sevi Islands quest. There's a lot of encounters here like Dot and Berry Forest, although this one kind of sucks since I miss out on Slaking here which is really good. Berry Forest is also where you you can get Lumberries and one Ayapapa Berry, which is helpful. You can also pick up the legendary dogs in this part of the game. They vary in viability, but none of them are really broken or oppressive at all, especially with this rule set. Suicune is kind of just bulky water plus and is outclassed by stuff like Milodic that has more reliable recovery. Raikou is probably the best and has some real viability for the Elite Four, but my Electabuzz starter outclasses it in my opinion. I guess that's pretty wild to say out loud, but you will understand what I'm saying at the end of this video. Entei is pretty easily the worst of the three, being quite unremarkable. It's largely outclassed by stuff like Magmar and Houndoom. I also pick up Moltres on Mount Ember, which takes 10 years to catch and I end up having to Master Ball it. It's decent and will go to exactly one fight between now and the end of the game. Lastly, I finish my Legendary Hall with Zapdos, although this is another electric that's outclassed by E-Buzz. It's very good though and a good option on runs with other starters. Giovanni is the final gym fight of the game, and he has an interesting team. This fight also does not have random AI, thankfully, so we won't be pulling our hair out dodging critical hits. 
Sharpedo does his thing in this fight and kills the Flygon and Rhydon back to back. Cacturin comes out next and it's important to get this thing out before Tyranitar because of Sandvale and Houndoom takes care of business. This baits in Swampert who has Hydro Cannon which loses its recharge turn in favor of lower accuracy and a freeze chance in this hack. Although Swampert misses, Sceptile is able to come in and take the kill with Leaf Blade. Persian is next up and this is another tedious 1v1 with Agron where I wither it down and deal with some hacks, while also taking a little bit of damage in the process on purpose. This is just to ensure that Tyranitar Earthquakes into Breloom, which can come in and take a kill with Brick Break, winning us badge 8, and getting us one step closer to the league. Before the Elite Four, we have one last face-off with our rival. A pre-damaged E-Buzz scores a lead frag on the Crobat. This ensures that I'm always dead to Frenzy Plant from Venusaur, which Moltres shrugs off nicely. A held Charcoal ensures a KO with Flamethrower. Alakazam comes in next, but this is fodder for the big lax. Houndoom comes in, and Breloom gets in on a Crunch from Houndoom, which is baited out because of Thick Fat on Snorlax. This Houndoom has a hasty nature, so with a held Black Belt, Mach punch just straight up kills it. Swampert hard counters this Ampharos set and Houndoom kills Jinx once again, unlocking Victory Road. There's two more encounters before the league, the first of which is Poliwag. Poliwrath is really good in this game, but unfortunately, it's too late for me to really use it. My last encounter is Rhydon, which is also good, but in the same boat where it's past the point of having any value. Fire Red Omega's Elite Four is interesting. The level curve makes the early fights more forgiving, and I think the real difficulty lies on the latter end and champion fights. Prepping this is a little bit of a nightmare since Fire Red Omega does not have its own damage calculator, so all calculations have to be done manually using a vanilla game calc. I put together a diverse team with six of my finest Pokemon. First up is Cockjuicer, the Espeon. This is my fast psychic type who is mostly here for Bruno, but also lets me play into a few outs later in the Elite Four. My second Pokemon is Cockjuicer, the Lapras, a shell armor tank with valuable water and ice stabs. This guy is crit proof and makes some specific interactions a lot safer. Third up is Cockjuicer, the Agron, my physical tank and defensive pivot who takes on a few key Pokemon. Fourth on the roster is Cockjuicer, the Swampert, who is here for exactly one Pokemon, although it's a good steering option if needed. Pokemon number five is Cockjuicer, the Electabuzz, my beautiful starter. This thing has a ton of speed and unique breaking power with Volt Tackle. It's got good coverage as well. E-Buzz is the first of two cleaners on this roster. My last team member is Cockjuicer, the Houndoom. The Route 1 reset that made everything worth it, with great typing and special stat. Houndoom is also one of the biggest beneficiaries of Badge Boost, getting the edge that takes it over the top. Now it's time to see if my gang of cock juicers can beat Fire Red Omega's finest. All right. Let's see how we did with baiting. <laughs> All right, we'll go first. Kill on this thing. That's easy, that's easy. Your EXP sharing Houndoom and needs as much EXP as it can get. Okay, slow mode next. Perfect. That's another free kill. Okay, my Lodic is in here. All right, we can just uh, break through this with Volt Tackle. I'm gonna take a bit of recoil, but that's all right. Warren's next. Damn, does Wiggly Cup just come out last? Ah, uh, that didn't matter. Okay, now it's looking really tough. All right, we go Agron here. All right, so this is a Lapras. Back into my Lapras. And this is, I think, a Rain Dance or T Bolt.
but let's see. We get to do something funny here. And let's get a free switch and I like the buzz. The VA. It just heals me. And then we can click this move again. Do I need to do this? No. I'm pretty sure T-Bolt kills it. I'm holding a magnet. But I can click the funny move when I want to. Who's gonna stop me? Alright. Is Lorelei down? Runo is probably the easiest fight of the entire Elite Four. I lead with Lapras and Chain Kill Steelix, Donphan, and Armaldo. This baits in Hitmontop, who hits a very soft Gen 3 high jump kick into Espeon. This Hitmontop has a Focus Band and Endeavor, so if the Focus Band procs and I get brought down to low HP, I can always protect to kill the Hitmontop with crash damage from high jump kick. But the Focus Band isn't real and it doesn't proc, so Espeon can clean up the rest of the fight with no problem. Alright, so she's got the stupid focus ban Shedinja. I'm just gonna do this. Zero point in dealing with any of this shit. Swords Dance here would be sick. Nice. Goodbye, Shedinja. Alright, this should be Sableye. Okay, nice. Alright, I'm gonna Toxic Sableye too. Yeah, it's gonna go for S-Toss, and that's okay. The idea here is we're gonna Chunk Sableye. That's not nothing for damage. Oh, uh, I mean, we can Ship Heal. But the idea is that we Chunk Sableye a little bit, and then we're gonna go Hard Switch into uh, E-Buzz, and we're gonna break through this with Bolt Tackle. Ooh, it goes for Shadow Ball. That's a crit. Holy fuck. Why would it click Shadow Ball there? Oh my god, dude. The D-Bus is a fucking goat. Okay, just give me Crobat next so I can chain this. Nice. Okay. Three. That was so cringe. But we actually did get enough, uh... I think Volt Tackle was there in case it recovered. I think that's why I had originally planned to use Volt Tackle. But, uh... Okay. Bing Bong. Alright. Big Houndoom EXP. I don't know if we're getting the fucking 72, man. I think it's shit for EXP. Okay, it's gonna hypnosis me, it's fine. Oh, calm mind, it's better. That's what the fuck I thought. All oh, the manual calcs. Insane fragging going on. Alright, Lance. Okay, first order of business. Never melt ice. Ice punch always kills. Kill Gyarados with Thunderbolt. Alright, Zard, we have to Volt Tackle this, uh, because we don't have enough special attack to kill it with Thunderbolt. 
but there's also a very important secondary purpose to clicking Bolt Tackle with this, and that is to intentionally damage ourselves. Aerodactyl is going to come out next. That is a Thunderbolt angle. This is a minus speed Brave Nature Aerodactyl. So pretty much any E-Buzz is going to be faster than this with Badge Boost, and it takes a free kill on this. But the cool thing here is that we have intentionally now basically pre-damaged ourselves to be dead to double edge from this Dragonite. Or not. It's gonna rain dance, okay. Cool thing is that we do still take this plus one double edge pretty comfortably. As you can see with shell armor, now we're some crit here. But this HP. More importantly the idea was that like you don't wanna take a plus two double edge or whatever. It's fine. Um anyways, at this HP at 135 at 269, we are Always exclusively dead to Focus Punch. Alright, I may have, uh, fucked up Calking that Dragon Instant. It's fine. And then if we got hit lower, we had, uh, Ayapaba. Um, like in case, in case there was a scenario where we took, like, two double edges or something. Alright, champ time, baby. Alright. Take one kill. We're asking how to do a lot this fight. We are asking how to do a lot. But it's gonna chain these two kills. Very important. Okay, Ampy's in next. Alright. I think should be okay. Tableau's fine, we don't care. I suppose I could have brought Flight on or something for this thing, but Swampert was a better steering option in the most of these fights anyways. Okay, Venusaur is here. This is gonna be Frenzy Plant. Miss here would be insanely good. Oh my god! Okay. Alright. Alright, I think we're- I think we just win. We're charcoal, this is gonna kill. We'll go to 72, and then we'll outspeed and kill Jinx. It's actually insane. Yes, dude! Alright, that actually went really well. Um... <laughs> if it, like, hit- like, crit poison was kind of the only thing that would have been- Oh, it's fine. Wait, actually I'm Lum. I'm think I think I'm Lum, not Charcoal. Oh fuck. I think we're fine. Yeah, there we go. Edge Shadow Ball just seems This Hound Doom is really good. Oh my god, L, 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 L. Yeah, wisp me, dude. I don't really care. You're such a fucking bot, dude. Oh my god. Stop with this game, I garbage. He's out, right? That's four, I'm pretty sure. I'm gonna go back into Hound Doom, he's just gonna Fire Blast. And then I can just kill this with Crunch or something. 
Yeah, he's just out. I know this. And that's the win, baby. It's too free for the go, man. It was great to revisit the classic Fire Red Omega. There are some newer iterations of this game, like the pretty popular DX version, but there's just something about the original with all the Gen 3 mechanics that has a unique charm to it. The first ROM hack Nuzlocke that I ever completed was on Fire Red Omega, so this run gave me a great wave of nostalgia. The hack itself is flawed, don't get me wrong. It's got weird balancing, wonky gym leader teams, and a ridiculous amount of healing item spam. But there's something about it, and I'm not totally sure what it is, but I'll always get a kick out of this game when I play it. At the end of the day, it's a classic, and a good introduction to ROM hack nuzlocking, even with some of the limitations that exist in Generation 3. I'd give it an 8 out of 10, although that ranking might be a little boosted by nostalgia. Anywho, if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe, and if you want to watch some of this stuff live, my Twitch is linked in the description. I hope everybody has a great day. Jude out.